good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. I am particularly excited today because we continue our epic Oceans Day, Oceans Week celebration. It is World Oceans Day today, June 8th, every single year. And since our inception, we've spent the entire week doing incredible broadcasts for the last seven years. We've got 21 programs this week. It has been a wild ride featuring some of the coolest scientists and explorers around this planet. And all of that is in conjunction with the amazing folks at the Explorers Club. Uh, Joe Grabowski, my partner here, is on the board of the Explorers Club and gets the chance to bring some of the coolest people on planet Earth live into classrooms every single day. If you want to check out their full list of events at the Explorers Club for Oceans Week, check out the link below. I'll make sure all our classes have that as well. Now, last year, we had the amazing chance to partner with the Endurance 22 Expedition. I grew up as a boy reading South, the Endurance Expedition. It is the single greatest adventure book of all time. And in it, Shackleton details the loss of his ship, the Endurance, and the harrowing tale of survival that he and his crew had to undertake to get out alive. Uh, they've been looking for the Endurance ship for quite some time now, but the Endurance 22 Expedition succeeded in finding it one of the coolest adventure stories, modern day adventure stories of all time. And today, in advance of a whole slew of events live at the Explorers Club, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. John Shears and Nico Vincent, the expedition lead and the subsea expedition manager from the Endurance 22 expedition. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to these guys joining us in the map room at the Explorers Club today to tell us a little bit about what makes the whale seem so special. So John, Nico, thank you so much for joining us today, guys, and uh, welcome to the broadcast. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. And uh, hello, hello to all the teachers and students out there. Yeah, it's a real privilege for us to be here. We've flown in uh, especially to be at the Explorers Club for the next couple of days. Um, and one of the highlights of our trip here to New York is to be up here in their map room uh, talking to you, um, uh, me and Nico together. So we're really looking forward to being able to tell you a little bit about uh, our expedition to find the endurance and also uh, about the Weddell Sea. As Jesse mentioned, what we're looking at uh, this week in New York is uh, World Oceans, and uh, we're very pleased and happy to be able to tell you a little bit about our adventures uh, in the Weddell Sea and what the Weddell Sea is like as a place. It's one of the most remote and pristine oceans in the world. Uh, I worked it out the other day using Google that uh, more people have been in Earth orbit than have ever been to the Endurance Sea location. So we're, but, but we're very lucky that we were able to do that. Very yeah. lucky that we were able to do that. But you want to say something, Nico? Yeah, I just said that it changes statistic about the new quantity of people in orbit and people in, uh, yeah. in weather. So, so what, what we're very happy to do is to, 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 to go, go through a few slides. Um, and hopefully those slides will uh, uh, encourage the students to ask us a few questions. So we'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll do a 20 minutes Q&A. Is that okay with you, Jesse? That is spectacular. Let's dive in. I'll take us to uh, a little bit about you gentlemen to kick us off so people can get a sense of who you are. <laughs> okay, so I'll kick off. So I'm John Shears. I'm a polar geographer. Um, I'm British. Uh, I spent many years working for the British Antarctic Survey and then at the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. I now run I'm very lucky, I run my own expedition exploration company, which is Polar Limited, and I was the expedition leader uh, for the Endurance 22, uh, but not just down in the ice in the Antarctic. Uh, to plan an expedition like this takes a long time and a lot of money. So Nico and I were working full time on this expedition for about two years, from about to August 2020, through to when we actually went to Antarctica uh, in February, uh, last year, February 2022, and we're still working on endurance now. The amazing discovery of the wreck has meant that we're, we're in constant demand to give talks and presentations and to be doing live streams like this with uh, uh, students and teachers from around the world. So that's me. Over to Nico. Uh, on my side, that I'm a subsea engineer. So since 30 years, I'm um, mainly working in special projects in Earth Orbit Waters. And um, me and my team, we found Plenty, plenty, very exciting things because working on special project is mainly recovering uh, devices lost at sea. So we have few world records um, 
But if, on, for example, Antoine de Saint Exupéry aircraft, you know, the famous Order of the Little Prince, which is a book which is the most highest sell in the world, uh, we found <coughs> the city of Cairo and recovered uh, 100 tons of silver coins for Her Majesty the Queen, uh, which is uh, which is the deepest cargo uh, recovered uh, of the world. And of course, last year we got the chance to be involved in endurance, but as well uh, with the famous explorer Victor Vescovo, who died in his submarine and found the deepest wreck of the world, which is USS Samuel B. Roberts by 6,800 meters depth. So a lot of engineering, a lot of challenge, and it's quite exciting. And it's a bit of a real honor to talk to you today. Thank you. OK. So thank you. Yes, Jesse, next. Yes, thank you for putting up the next slide. So. I'm sure that many of you out there have already studied the expedition um, quite a lot and have followed us on our adventures, but there'll be some people who are joining us for the first time. So I always think it's quite good to have a bit of a recap and make sure that everyone is on the uh, same page as to what we're going to be talking about. So first of all, Antarctica. So Antarctica, at the bottom of the world, uh, you can see on the, the map there, uh, the, the continents which surround Antarctica, South America, Africa, uh, Australia, and you can see that the, uh, the big white mass of Antarctica, it's covered in ice and um, places the ice sheets in, in Antarctica can be, can be up to four kilometers thick. Uh, only 1% of Antarctica is uh, ice free. It's a very cold, desolate, barren place. In many places in the center of Antarctica, it's more like a desert. There's no, no, no rainfall, it's all snow, but even the snow, is, uh, uh, is only, it only rarely happens that it snows. Um, no polar bears there. Polar bears live up in the uh, up in the Arctic. There are no rivers in Antarctica. Um, no native peoples, um, and it's only very recently being discovered. We'll talk a little bit about it. You know, the Weddell Sea, where we went, was only found 200 years ago. So it's all very uh, uh, many parts of Antarctica are still undiscovered. Uh, very rarely visited, very, very remote. And it's a big place, it's about the same size as Europe or the same size as continental uh, USA and Canada combined. It's a big place to explore. So that's a bit about Antarctica. And then you can see at, on the on the map between the Falkland Islands and Antarctica, you can see it's marked on the map, the Weddell Sea. So that it's a big, big marine embayment, large sea, and that's where we were working to find the wreck of Shepperton's endurance. That's where the ship got crushed and sank to the bottom of the sea back in November 1915. Next one. Right, so who was James Weddell? Well, James Weddell was, was British. Um, and 200 years ago, uh, in February um, 1823, he took his uh, two ships, called the Beaufoy and the Jane, uh, he took them further south than anybody else had been in these incredible, these small wooden sailing ships. Uh, and the reason he was going that far into Antarctica because in, uh, was because in, in, in those times, uh, they were hunting for seals and for whales. Um, and hunting in that fashion was very, very profitable. They could make a large amount of money. So they could afford to send expeditions all the way from the UK from England into Antarctica to hunt for seals. Uh, and if they were lucky and they found that several thousand seals and filled up the ship with their seal pelts, they could make a small fortune. Indeed, um, Weddell made so much money that he was able to buy a ship, Jane, uh, on the back of one of his voyages. These days, Seals and whales are all protected in Antarctica, so this industry no longer exists. But in those times, in the uh, uh, in, in the 1800s, it was a, uh, a pioneering voyage and one of the ways to explore the continents. So he set set sail, went very far south into the Weddell Sea, was the first one to find this marine area, and it was later named after him. Uh, he also discovered a seal. So there's a seal named after him as well, called the Weddell seal. And the Weddell seal is the most southerly breeding land mammal uh, in the world. 
Right, so there's a bit of background to uh, James Weddle, the Weddle Sea, and now a little bit about our expedition. So our expedition was called Endurance 22. I'm sure many of you followed us as we went to Antarctica. We departed on the 5th of February of last year, 2022, uh, and we were on a South African ship, the SA Agulhas II, a modern research icebreaker, specially built for working in ice. And she took us down into the Weddell Sea, and uh, we reached the survey area where we thought the wreck had sunk uh, on the 6th, 16th of February. Uh, and then we began both scientific research. I'm sure many of you also were tuning in to listen to Tim Jacob from Reach the World because he was live streaming when we were in the ice. Uh, and then at the same time, Nick and his team were doing the subsea operations. Uh, and then we finally returned back to Cape Town in South Africa. That was our gateway and our return port. Uh, we returned on the 20th of March, 2022. And you can see in the top slide, we're all wearing face masks uh, on that slide on the far left. That's me. In the middle, that's Captain Knowledge Bengu. Uh, Knowledge is the first uh, black uh, ice pilot and captain um, in South Africa. Um, has worked in Antarctica for nearly 30 years. Highly experienced man to be working with. And then on the far right was our ice pilot because of the biggest challenge that we faced was managing to get the ship through the ice to the sinking location. So we needed a specially trained uh, navigator, ship's captain, and he was called Captain Freddie Lyham. And his primary job was to navigate us through the ice. But to get there, we had to sail across the Southern Ocean, and you can see some of the sea conditions that I had to face in the bottom picture, big waves coming over the deck, which worried Nico, because he was worried that some of these big waves might uh, uh, swamp um, or even carry off some of his equipment, which was stored at the stern of the vessel. But luckily, everything was lashed down and stowed away carefully, and so we had no damage despite the, the stormy weather that we faced going to Antarctica. Next one. Right, I'm going to pass to Nico now to tell you a little bit about the subsea operations and just to say a little bit about what it's like to operate. Uh, a remotely operated vehicle, a marine robot in Antarctica. So over to you, Nico. Well, it's quite unusual. Um, mainly as a uh, industry, usually we have very, very dedicated procedures to run back on the water. <clears throat> and when we walk on the ice, we have to walk, to, to learn everything from scratch and change everything. The, the, the most important thing to, to understand is um, when you walk in open water, the underwater vehicle is always the master of the operation. So that means that even if you have a vehicle which is 40 kilos and a vessel which is 200 meter length on, on the surface, the vessel is quietly following the vehicle to be sure that it's not different in the subsea operations. In Antarctica, it's so completely different. The highest is a master. So we have been obliged to invent new systems to be able to walk on fixed position. Because until now, most of the scientists which walk with such a vehicle just <coughs> have chosen to drift with ice, which is the steepest way, and, and uh, as well the most easiest way. However, when you're looking for our shipwrecks, you have historians which have made a decision of the search box that you have to go. So we have been obliged to find new solutions to, uh, to cover this box, and it has been quite challenging, and which is as well the reason why we worked during two years before the expedition to anticipate all scenarios and all options to make it real. <clears throat> and one of the first decisions I made two years before we leave is uh, to use tethered vehicle. You see this tiny cable which relying the vessel which is in red uh, on, the, on, the left, uh, on the right corner because of that subsea vehicle which is yellow. <clears throat> the reason why uh, of this wire is because uh, it's allowing us to have real-time control on the autonomous vehicle. Usually when you launch an autonomous vehicle, it's doing his task plan as a seabed. And if you he, if he have any issue, it's just calling the vessel on top, hey, come back, I have an issue, please support me, help me. And it's turning around until you have a reply from his master on, on the surface. <clears throat> when you are on the weather sea, you might be far away and you may receive no reply 
and then the vehicle is just making a, um, an emergency ascent and stuck and might be stuck in the ice. So the reason why is this tiny wire are always to has to keep permanent control. So it has been really a game changer on the whole operation we organized. And the funny stuff is that uh, we deployed up to eight kilometers of wire, uh, which is extremely far away uh, for such operation. And uh, the maximum uh, horizontal range that we got between the vessel and the vehicle has been four multiple miles. So it's really unusual to walk that way. And I remember some very, very hard chat with the engineer of the vehicle from southern Sweden, explaining to me that it is absolutely not the way to walk. <laughs> but unfortunately, I remind to them, yes, but we have ice, and we are under ice is driving everything. And I did the world in the world clearest water. That, that's absolutely true. And, uh, we got the chance to have absolutely crystal clear water on this area. And you have to be aware that the Antarctic Ocean is something absolutely critical for the climate change. Because this is a single ocean in the world which is shared with all the others on the planet. We uh, have, On every ocean in the planet, you have some water coming from Antarctica. So this ocean is absolutely critical for our planet, and it's absolutely extremely important to keep it, to protect it for the future. So what can I say for this? Uh, do you have three hours? Because uh, I mean, um, <laughs> if you want me to talk about the subsea operations, <laughs> that's the minimum time that I need. <laughs> I, I wish we had three hours, guys. I really do. Some of our classes have to go to math and science and other lessons in the day, but. I know that they can follow up with all these amazing resources you guys have been doing for the last couple of years to make sure that teachers can keep the education going. However, if you're good to continue on, we can get lots of questions about the subsurface conditions, if that works for you. Okay, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy that um, I think the key thing for us is the, the students to be able to ask us questions and so on. So yeah, maybe what we can do now is we've introduced ourselves, introduced the expedition Talked a little bit about the Weddell Sea. Um, maybe you can keep running with uh, the slide deck, uh, Jesse, and we'll just take uh, questions from the uh, from the students now. Fantastic. Well, if that works for you guys, then I'll, I'll absolutely bring uh, classes in. We've got four classes joining us live on camera, a bunch on YouTube. If the YouTube classes want to chime in with questions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, one of the questions we got via email, actually, with one of your last slides was, why go from South Africa to the Weddell Sea as opposed to South America, which is so much closer? Okay, uh, a couple of reasons there. One, that the ship that we were using was a South African ship. Yeah. So it was far easier for us to get all of our cargo and equipment uh, into Cape Town um, and work through the South African authorities there. Uh, also, as I pointed out, uh, we still had COVID then, and it was very difficult to take anything into South America. Indeed, taking stuff to South Africa was, was very tricky for us. Yeah, 50 tons, remember? Yeah, so oh, yeah, so, I, I, so, so, so Nico, Nico wanted to send all of our bulky equipment yeah. by, 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 by ship, but you couldn't get any shipping containers or time on uh, container ships. So in the end, we had to fly, fly 50 tons of equipment from Europe to South Africa uh, to make sure that it met the ship on time yeah we charter we charter an aircraft from belgium and we have been obliged to send everything in belgium yeah up to south africa well so this gear that we're talking about 50 tons is a lot of gear what are we exactly talking about we talked about you being a little concerned about it getting damaged on route uh what kind of robots what kind of tools are you actually using to explore and go look for this wreck in the sea well um you know usually when you go on subsea operation you bring with you a lot of spare. However, if you have an issue, you have always the opportunity to have a vessel or, or somebody which bring something. When you are in Antarctica, you are in the middle of nowhere. As John explained, this is an area where nobody's going. So we just not got only spares, we got everything in triple. So uh, two vehicles, three winches, uh, dual, uh, dual top sides uh, uh, on top of these pairs. But that's not all, because um, we were not sure 
that ice will allow the vessel to join the field, we were ready to launch a black or from an ice camp. So we built an ice camp from scratch uh, with launch and recovery system, uh, drilling machine, uh, generators, ice camp, life camp, yes, tents, food, everything. So we got 40 tons of equipment to, to, to install on ice to be able to launch this vehicle. And for that, we got a helicopter able to lift 1.5 ton only. So we even work on the fl full flight plan to be ready to launch this camp quicker as we can yeah. on ice, because again, ice is drifting. So you can stay on site only two days and then you need to move the camp. So you need two years. So that's the reason why we got so much heavy equipment. I'm really glad you highlighted this and the fact that you had multiples of things because one of the questions we get in programs all the time, whether it's space exploration, cave diving, Antarctic work, is how do you prepare and how important is that? And I think you can talk to any expedition leader in the world and the preparation is way more of the expedition than the actual undertaking of it. There's so much work that goes into picking the right people, the right materials, testing them out in a variety of ways to make sure that when you get there, when you're searching for something like the endurance, you're not going to have an issue because of the stuff that you've prepped. So I'm, I'm really glad we got that question. Yeah. And, and Jesse, that's a very good point. So one of the key things that we had to do was to test. So um, and we were on a very tight time schedule. Again, we had all the problems with the COVID pandemic. So we tested the vehicles um, where Nico lives in France. We went to a very deep water location in the Mediterranean. Um, to make sure that the Saab safe two vehicles, the winches, the fiber optic cable, uh, the men who, and women who are running the vehicles also were trained in doing that. So we had a, if you like, a training camp um, in, in October 2021. And we all went to France uh, to learn how to use the vehicles and make sure that they could be operated safely. And the guys knew exactly all the different procedures before we went to Antarctica. So. As, as well as having everything in triplicate, uh, we have to make sure that everyone is properly trained. Uh, the other key issue for, for me as the expedition leader was to make sure that everyone was fit and healthy. Uh, that's the other thing you have to consider. We're so, so far away from any help whatsoever. We have to be our own rescue service. So even somebody, somebody just breaking their thumb, that can actually be extremely serious because we're about 10 days sail from the nearest port and the nearest hospital. So if you broke your wrist, broke your thumb, broke, broke your ankle, that would probably actually be the end of the expedition. Yeah. So we had to make sure that everyone was very was fit, they were healthy, and that we took safety as the top prior, priority, and that nobody got injured, because if someone got injured, then probably the expedition would have to, then have to end. I remember you mentioned Tim Jacob from Reach the World who helped set up this program today. And I remember chatting with him in advance of heading to South Africa to get on board the boat and how nervous he was. Like, I'm going to do absolutely nothing to injure myself and I'm going to try hard not to get COVID. Never was like, we were waiting for this for years. We're not going to blow it in the last few weeks. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, live classes. Ms. McCluskey, I'm coming to you guys in just a second. Ms. Rampers had a great question that I have just a stunning slide to highlight. So her question is, is there any deep ocean life in Antarctica that isn't found anywhere else? And to highlight this, I'm going to bring up the, the view of the ship, which I mean, I don't know if you gentlemen knew or expected in your wildest dreams that it would look like this, but the view of the ship on the seafloor is one of the most incredible things I've seen in my entire life. And it's teeming with all these animals on it. So if you could speak to some of the wildlife on the seabed that was down there, I'd, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've already talked a little bit about how the water is so clear in this particular sea, the Weddell Sea. And that's because there's no pollution in the Weddell Sea uh, and it's completely surrounded uh, by glaciers and ice shelves. So there's very little sediment in the Weddell Sea. So it's very, very clear. No, no, nothing to disturb um, uh, the views of the cameras. So that's part, part of the reason why uh, you can see the wildlife growing on the wreck so clearly. Um, but the another aspect of it is that uh, the ship is sitting proud of the seabed. So it's like a, a, like a like little mini oasis. Uh, Nico and his team were scanning the seafloor for 18 days before we found the wreck. And there was nothing, it was absolutely flat. It was like um, a table 
uh, yeah. the, the top of the table, absolutely flat. Um, so when you have something above the seabed, which organisms can colonize on, then it becomes like a, a little mini o oasis. And in the slide there, that's the slide of the stern, and it's called uh, the well deck. So you can see the ship's wheel there. And then amazingly on the right, you can see there's a porthole with a window, and that's actually Shackleton's cabin. So uh, it's, it's really, really interesting to be able to see this and to, to see just how well preserved the ship is in these yeah. very cold waters, very clear waters. But also you can see growing on it, if you look at the rail, you can see that there are anemones, there are sea squirts, there are sea lilies, all sorts of amazing creatures. And what we're um, doing at the moment is digitizing all the data um, and then we'll allow marine scientists to look at it in really, really great detail in close up. And we think there might be some um, new species uh, living on that wreck, uh, new forms of uh, animals and plants which have never been uh, recorded in the world or seen, maybe completely new to, to science. And then if you go back to the slide, I just, um, just want to talk about the fish there. So you can see there's a picture of some fish there. These are ice fish. Uh, they live at um, much shallower depths. They don't, uh, the, we found the wreck at 3,000 meters. And these fish are called ice fish. They live in the Weddell Sea, but at uh, shallower depths at about 500 meters. And uh, recently, um, basically it was a, a year before we found the endurance, uh, they, found, uh, they found these enormous colonies of ice fish uh, living on the sea floor, where you can see in the image the round circles, that's the nest of a, of a pair of ice fish. And they estimate in this colony, which lives in the Weddell Sea, it could be as many as 60 million pairs as, of ice fish. <laughs> and no one knew, no one knew that that existed until 2021. And they found it by accident. Scientists <laughs> from Germany who were looking for something else, doing some studies of the water column, they just put a camera down towards the seabed and they found nest after nest after nest after nest after nest. That the, that the area of, um, of these nests is huge. It's, it's hundreds of kilometers square, far bigger than where we are now, New York. It's far bigger yeah. than New York. And that's one massive colony of ice fish. Incredible. It's wild. We've been featuring uh, ocean explorers and a lot of deep sea biologists over the last couple of days. And, and universally, we get the question, have you found new species? And the answer is every time we look in the ocean, especially the deep ocean, we find new habitats, we find new agglomerations of wildlife, we find new species. It really is a, a widely unexplored region of the planet. And it's a really exciting opportunity for future scientists or explorers of all kinds. I will note too, for any deep sea keen people, you mentioned the British Antarctic Survey earlier, Hugh Griffiths, we've had on the broadcast many times. Okay. I, encourage, I encourage our folks to go to our YouTube channel and look him up because if you want some of my favorite programs we've ever done, it, he covers the deep sea wildlife in Antarctica and it is. He's wild. very good. He is very good. I well worth watching. <laughs> Ms. McCluskey's class, I wanna come to you guys. If you wanna unmute your mic, come on in at Earl Kitchener. Uh, you can take us away with a question. Hey guys, grade fives. <laughs> All right, good morning, and thank you for um, educating us about this today. We have Hunter who's going to come up with a question. Hey, Hunter. Wait, um, what's, uh, when you um, did a AVU on February 16th, what's an AVU? Oh, an AUV, AVU or AUV or? AUV, sorry. Oh, AUV. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks, man. <laughs> He's asking what an AUV is. So. Ah, okay. What is an AUV? An AUV is an uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. In fact, this is a robot uh, that you um, that you you, uh, you you uh, you you drive from surface. So, in fact, you input in before the dive a task plan on it on his computer, and then he's diving, and with his own sensor, he's making the job on the subsea, uh, on the on the seabed. Sorry. And then it's coming back autonomously on the surface. So this is a difference between an AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle, with an EUV, remote operated vehicle, which usually it's a robot, which is uh, linked by wire up to the surface with power and data, and that that you drive like a remote car from the surface. The, 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 the thing which is interesting with the saboteurs, the vehicles that are chosen for for, um, 
422 is that uh, is both, in fact, is an hybrid. It can switch from AUV world to AOV world by just pushing a switch. So it has been a great opportunity because uh, we got best the best of both worlds. We were launching the vehicle for long range search autonomously, and then if we saw something interesting, it just switching the switch, and take the control manually, and be able to look at uh, any target. It has been precisely uh, the good point when we found the wreck, because when we found the wreck, we got two guys uh, on the shelter in front of the screen. And uh, looking at the size scan sonar data acquisition, size scan sonar data, it's, it's, it's a uh, sensor which allows it to give you an image of, of the seabed. And they saw something strange, a spot on the screen. So they called us, we came back on the, we came back on the, uh, on the shelter and made the decision to make a high, high frequency signature to be sure that this unusual spot is something exciting. So we came back to the barracks and suddenly made marvelous images of the ship leg. Yeah. And then well, I, I asked it to the guys because it's a funny story. At, at that point, you have to understand that the AUV is powered by batteries. Okay, So you do not have any power wire coming from the surface. So we were very low on batteries when we got this sonar signature. And the AUV pilot asked me, Nico, I want to go back to the surface, otherwise we go to an emergency ascent. I said, no, 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 no. Nobody come back to the surface until I have seen woods in front of the camera. So we did the third circle and came back on the target and driving slowly back to the target, arriving, starting to see debris everywhere, and suddenly, a wall of wood in front of us. We arrived on port side, just we elevated the vehicle, arrived on the main deck, just turn, go on, go on the central ship, arrive in the wall, and then we got no more batteries at all. And we make an emergency. Yes. <laughs> but, but we knew that we found the red. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the only other, I guess, uh, analogy that you can have for our classes in today is when they land the robot on Mars. Like, people have been waiting for this for years, they've been planning, and there's that moment where it's going through the atmosphere. Is it going to land? Is it going to happen? And then suddenly it's there, and you see the scientists lose their minds. I can only imagine what it was like on the ship uh, when you confirmed that you would found it. Just absolute euphoria. What a, what a wild experience. Like, it was a great time, indeed. Yeah. Incredible, guys. <laughs> Um, St. Isidore Virtual School, Miss Randall's class, who's been joining us all week. You really, you're in these more than I am. You should come host. Uh, you have a great question from your student, but I want to come to you so you can share it live with us. Welcome in, 7 eight. Hi, Miss Randall. Hi. Can you Hi. hear us okay? We sure can. Hi. So, so, yeah, so our grade 7 student, Martina, had a great question, and it's kind of like a two-point question. We wanted to know what are the effects of the climate change on the animals that are there, as well as the iceberg numbers, and how has that impacted the size distribution of Antarctica as a continent? Okay, so you want to know about climate change impacts and basically the, uh, how the um, environment and the size of Antarctica is changing. Yep. Okay, so climate change. Um, uh, where I used to work for British Antarctic Survey on what's called the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, the peninsula has warmed by about three degrees centigrade in the last 50 years. So I first went to Antarctica, I'm a bit of a veteran now. Uh, I went first to Antarctica in 1991. So many of the places that I saw, which were covered in snow or ice, had melted. Uh, and that's causing um, consequences for a whole range of different things, um, particularly for us in the future, because if you've got ice melting off the land, then that's going to raise sea levels. So places like where we are now in New York, uh, you could get sea level rise primarily from melting glaciers and ice sheets in Antarctica, maybe up to a meter in uh, in, a, uh, in 100 years' time. So that will have devastating consequences on low-level populations and buildings right across the world. So that's why it's so important to try and mitigate our, um, our, our effect on the planet and make sure we try our very, very best to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, because that's the primary driver. 
So, so climate change is impacting on Antarctica. Uh, one of the big issues at the moment is, is whether that's really going to change the sea ice. We've already talked about the big challenge for us was sea ice. And we're seeing some very, very quick changes there. So when uh, I went on the first expedition to look for endurance in 2019, we got stuck in the ice several times. We had very thick uh, multi-year ice, ice that's uh, refrozen. So it could be three, four, maybe even five meters thick. Um, when we went last year in 2022, the ice was much thinner, uh, less than a meter. It was all what we call first year ice. And there was much less of it. It was much easier for the ship to move. And we've been looking at some of the satellite imagery uh, for this uh, past season in Antarctica, and it's even less. So you might be seeing uh, a sudden change in the sea ice patterns in Antarctica, primarily because of uh, climate change and uh, uh, ocean warming. And, and in the Weddell Sea, uh, yes, we're seeing warmer temperatures, and that affects these, uh, yeah, for, for example, ice fish. They require very cold water temperatures. Many of the creatures living on the sea floor also require cold, cold, cold temperatures to survive. Um, so if the ocean's warm, that could have a very serious consequence on the marine life living there. Thank you for the detailed answer. And I will note for our classes, uh, my birthday was recently, and the first thing that I wanted to own was Frozen Planet 2 from the BBC, which is just the greatest documentary ever on the changing planet on both our north and southern uh, hemispheres or poles. Uh, so I do encourage our classes, check that out if you want to learn more about that in great depth. Uh, but John, I love the perspective of someone who's been going down for decades now and seeing that change firsthand, that really is uh, invaluable. So thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Uh, Miss Randall. We had Mr. Zangoli's class uh, before they had to run off for another period. They shared a few in the chat and so I, they wanted to know uh, how long does it take to get there and how long do you stay for when you're down there? Okay, well on this expedition, um, departing from Cape Town to get on to the to the work site, uh, that took about 10 days. And then actually on site, we thought we could find the ship quite rapidly. So we originally thought we were Bit optimistic and we'd find it in 10 days and then we'd get back uh, in another 10 days. So we, we had a, an initial plan of between 30 to 35 days. Um, as it transpired, we, we, we got onto the wreck site really quite easily, but we didn't find anything. Um, so we were, um, we had to extend our ship's charter from 10 days out towards 20 days. Um, we were at uh, day 18 yep. when, we, when we, we found the wreck. So we were really near the end. Uh, I thought I thought we weren't going to find the wreck. I was getting very, very worried about it. The weather was beginning to change. Temperatures were dropping. Um, we were going down to about minus 20 degrees centigrade then. So for Nico and the guys working on the back deck, which is out in the open, that, you know, that's, that's you know, extreme temperatures to be, to be working in. You can't really be working outside for more than about half an hour, 40 minutes before you have to come in and warm up and get a warm drink and uh, you know, have a bit of a break from the cold. Um, it, was, it was also, uh, you're moving from a period of uh, permanent daylight, you're that far south, that during the summer it's permanent daylight, and then the winter it's permanently dark. So we're now getting into um, long periods of darkness, um, which also makes it very difficult to operate the, uh, uh, the AUVs and the subsea operation. So, uh, so, um, the uh, so it was you know we 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 really were, were very short of time so in the end we were away for forty five days but uh, but it was worth it because we found probably you know one of the most famous shipwrecks in the world in probably the most challenging conditions uh, ever attempted to try and yeah. find a shipwreck in the world. We cover around eighty percent of the search box before the finder. Wow, look at that. That's so. Um, we got five minutes left for additional questions, but I want to note this is the difference between a confident expedition leader and someone who's read a lot of stories over their life because you assumed you'd find it quickly and I knew that you had to find it near the very end because that adds the drama so that you can have over your speeches, right? They never they never find the species when they're on, like looking for a snow leopard on the first day. It's always the last hour of filming and then it appears on the mountain ridge. Come on. Um, nearly outside the search box uh, yeah. on, on not much ship like research. So, uh, so, so as an expedition leader, of course, I would have been very, very happy to have found it on the first day. Um, and it saved us, saved, saved us an awful lot of time, effort, and, and money. But 
Uh, Nick and the team kept going. We had a what, what we call a search box. So there's an area where we thought the wreck would be located. Um, and in that, uh, we, we were very fortunate because Shackleton's expedition team took very detailed records. He had a fantastic ship's master, uh, Captain Frank Worsley. Um, you can read about him in uh, Shackleton's book, South, and he wrote some books himself. Uh, he was a fantastic navigator. Uh, and even when the, um, they were camped on the ice, they abandoned the ship, camped on the ice. Uh, when the ship sinks, he has the presence of mind to use his sextant. There's no GPS, yeah. no modern satellite dot, um, uh, technology to identify the location. He can't just look it up on his phone where they are. He has to use a sextant. He has to use special tables. It's a very complex process, but he, had a, he gave a very accurate position uh, where he thought the wreck uh, would go down. And indeed, we found the wreck um, only seven kilometers away from uh, where he'd given the correct, uh, given what he thought was the correct position. So a fan fantastic bit of navigational skill. Absolutely. We, um, I, I have highlighted this a couple of times. It reads like a thriller. Like really, there's no better adventure book of all time. And I'm glad you mentioned the name Sextant as a tool because inevitably, if you use a Sextant or even say the word, you sound like you really know what you're doing no matter where you do in life. So I'm glad we snuck that into the broadcast today. Gentlemen, we have time for three more questions. We'll do like a rapid fire round. I know some of our classes have to go to some other classes. So Ms. Rampersad's class in Toronto, they wanted to know grade ones, how far down have you explored? And when you found the wreck, how deep was it at? That's one for Nico. Well, uh, the, the depth was 3,008 meters depth. 3,008 3, meters, sorry. So um, we got the chance that the seabed is quite flat. Uh, because from the full north east to the southwest, we got less than 80 meters of delta, so it's a very flat seabed and strong enough to, to, to receive the wreck. So, unfortunately, uh, because we, we burned almost all our time to search her, we spent quite a long time on her, <coughs> only two days. Uh, dedicated on two dives. Uh, over these two dives, when you consider the time to move the vessel, uh, dive down, ascent, descent, positioning, settings, and blah, blah, blah. At the end, we spent only eight hours over the ship. So we have been obliged to make some decision about what we do. And our choice has been to make a 3D model of the wreck. Yeah. For that, we deployed uh, unusual uh, sensors, uh, which has been for the first time used uh, on this kind of wrecks. And I insist on that because most of you have heard on the press a couple of weeks ago that the Titanic has been made in 3D. And the reason why the Titanic has been made in 3D, it's because the software used for that has been deployed and invent for endurance. So we work two years. We work two years with some uh, our partners, mainly in Canada, yeah. to, to, to create this software and create all the devices to make this 3D model. And now, believe me, it's incredible, unbelievable. It is. We have a facsimile of the web, which is one millimeter perfect. And we expect very soon to share it first with scientists and then with the uh, public domain. Yep. So just be patient and soon you may, will be able to have VR glasses and walk yourself on the deck of the endurance by 3,000 meter depth. I'm, I'm heading. I'm going to, I'll be the first one. You can do the test beta with me, okay? I'll come down to New York. We'll make it happen. I can tell you, Jesse, in the, the teaching series, that it'll be phenomenal. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 yeah. We're not joking. You'll be able to walk on the deck and enjoy it. I believe you. I believe anything you guys tell me. You pulled this off. It's a great time. By the way, I will note, um, not surprising at all that Canadians made this possible. We make the best maple syrup. We're the best hockey players, and we're pretty cool <laughs> in engineering. All the Canada Arm 3 stuff. We got some good stuff going on up here. Wow. Um, 
I'm going to head to Ms. McCluskey's class for one final question. I'm also really proud of myself for being able to nail the phrase Ms. McCluskey's class like three times in this broadcast. So there you go, guys. Uh, come on in, Earl Kitcher, to wrap us up with one final question, Great Fives. <laughs> All right. So we noticed the colony of fish at the bottom there. We're worried if there's any uh, fear of bringing back a species when you bring your, um, like, an invasive species by accident. Uh, well, well and we, yes. So you're asking about some. Um, yeah, are there any risks of an uh, invasion, invas us bringing invasive species back with us? Well, uh, in our expedition, no. So when Nico deployed the, um, uh, the Saab Sabertooth, our autonomous underwater vehicle, the AUV, um, we were under strict instructions that we couldn't touch anything on the wreck, we couldn't collect anything or remove anything. So it's purely visual, um, um, camera and uh, scanning that we did of the wreck, we didn't actually touch anything at all. So there's no risk of taking anything off the, off the wreck and then uh, maybe you know, polluting uh, oceans elsewhere. Um, and it, but the bigger problem is the opposite way, that we could be bringing in invasive species, say from uh, the waters around South Africa and bringing them to Antarctica. So all our equipment had to be specially cleaned and sterilized and had to be authorized in South Africa, yeah. uh, that it was all clean uh, before we could actually deploy it. Cool. Um, so there's no risk of us taking invasive species to Antarctica. So we were very, very conscious all the way through that this was an absolute pristine environment. As, as Jesse, as you said, in, in many respects, like going to Mars, yeah. so very careful that you don't introduce anything and disrupt the natural ecosystem. I'm really glad we, we, I've actually, I've done over a hundred broadcasts about Antarctic waters. We've never had that question. So thanks uh, guys, that was fantastic. I will note if you're interested to uh, ballast water and how ships move in and out of harbors is a big issue in the world for introducing invasive species. And there's new restrictions and regulations on that taking place all over the planet to make sure that we don't bring species that aren't supposed to be somewhere to a new location. So great question guys. So, so just to add on that on ballast water. So once you get uh, into the Antarctic Treaty area, 60 degrees south, you cannot you cannot exchange your ballast water. You have to basically keep it on board. Yeah. So, um, so you cannot so you cannot take some ballast water that maybe you collected in South Africa and yeah. then discharge it in Antarctica and then maybe release um, invasive plankton or other small species into Antarctic waters. That's completely forbidden. That's good to hear. Um, Gentlemen, I know we could talk all day long. Our classes do need to head out in a minute, so I will note a few quick things. If people want to check out more on your amazing expedition, endurance22.org, we'll get you those first VR headsets to go walk on the deck together if we uh, check that out more. Uh, I would encourage you to check out how they preserve the ship, so the Falcon Maritime Heritage Trust, you can check out their website below as well. Um, John mentioned that this unwieldy URL is the World Geographical Society's uh, Endurance 22 Teacher Resources. I'll make sure all our registered classes have this link to keep the learning going when you're done this broadcast. Uh, and I want to say a huge thanks again to the Explorers Club for hosting John and Nico today. You can check out their full Oceans Week uh, ceremonies and celebrations here. If you want to fly down to New York and see these guys in person, like right after this program, uh, hop on a plane right when you're done. I can't. I'm in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, so I can't get there in time, but maybe some of you guys can. Uh, and before we wrap up, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say thanks and farewell in a minute. Is there any final message about the expedition uh, that you'd like to share to leave our kids with today? I think I think chase your dreams. Um, I think both of us knew that it was a, a big risk that we might not find it, um, but uh, we knew we had a good team. We had the latest technology with us, um, yeah. so we were prepared to take that risk and chase our dream, and uh, we achieved it. So I think that's a message for you know, all the teachers and the kids out there that you know if you prepare. If, if you really work at it, you can. Yeah. You, you, can. Up. you can mm -hmm. get your dream. Well, kudos to you gentlemen and the entire Endurance 22 team for accomplishing this. It's an incredible thing. And I'm so excited to feature many more broadcasts in the months and years to come to feature even more as you continue to share this work with the world. Uh, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teachers to say thank you and farewell with me. Ms. Rampersad, Ms. Randall's class, Ms. McCluskey's class, we want to unmute your mic. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, guys. Thank Bye you.